but a Zika virus can cause a viral infection that leads to neurological birth defects. We're going to talk about that in this lesson. It is a virus in the viral family Flaviviridae. It is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus, and it was originally discovered in rhesus monkeys in Uganda. And the first recorded human cases of the Zika virus occurred in 1952 in Uganda and Tanzania. So the previous outbreaks of Zika virus have included the outbreak in the Yap Islands of Micronesia in 2007. Here's a map showing the general location of the Yap Islands. In 2013 to 2014, the French Polynesian Islands had an outbreak of Zika virus as well, leading to many of the infant population being affected. And the more recent outbreak that probably many of us have heard about was the outbreak that occurred in 2015 to 2016, which occurred in South America and the Caribbean. So South America is slightly cut off here, but South America was affected and the Caribbean was affected. So currently, if we take a look at a map here where the mosquito has been found that can actually lead to a Zika virus infection, here are the countries that it has been found in. So almost all of South America, Central America, and parts of North America, so particularly the southern U.S. states. And we can see it in several countries throughout Africa, and we can see it in South Asia and Southeast Asia as well. So how is the virus transmitted? It is transmitted through a mosquito bite, and it is by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. This is the same mosquito that transmits dengue fever and yellow fever. So this can be a pesky organism. And it can be transmitted by the related species, Aedes albopictus. And what we do find is that the mosquito tends to bite people in the early morning hours and late afternoon and evening hours. So there's a period of the day where these mosquitoes are less likely to bite, midday hours and at night, but they can still bite at those times as well. We can also see it being transmitted vertically. And what I mean by vertically transmitted is vertical generation. So you can think about parents to children. And this is where this virus becomes more important in pathology. So we're going to talk a bit more about this. The vertical transmission from mother to fetus is what we care about. And this can occur. And the Zika virus can also be transmitted horizontally. So what I mean by horizontal is from one person to another, not a parent to a child. So this can occur through blood transfusions, can occur even through sexually transmitted infections and other exposures as well, organ transplants, laboratory contamination, those types of transmissions. So when a mosquito carrying the Zika virus bites us, what happens? So the Zika virus carrying mosquito can land on us, take a blood meal, and the virus can then infect our underlying tissues. And they can then travel into the bloodstream causing viremia. It can then travel throughout the body and enter into places like the cerebral spinal fluid, so in the central nervous system, can even get into our tears. So there's been findings where a patient that's infected with the Zika virus, if they check their tears, they can actually find the virus in their tears. And the virus can even travel and migrate into the genital urinary system. And it has been found in the sperm and vaginal fluid of people infected with the virus. And what's important to us is that it can cross the placenta. It can cause a vertical transmission from mother to fetus, can enter the fetus, infect the fetus, and cause neurological birth defects, what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. What are some of the signs and symptoms of the person that is infected in the first place? So when that mosquito takes a bite, it takes about two to 14 days before the patient experiences symptoms. There's a two to 14 day incubation period. Most cases, however, are asymptomatic. So even if a patient is infected with the Zika virus, they may be having the Zika virus in their system, but they might not even have symptoms. So symptoms generally occur in about 20 to 25% of patients. So again, majority of patients are asymptomatic. And even when they do get symptoms, it's a mild clinical presentation. It's rare that the Zika virus causes a severe infection. So what are some of the symptoms we might see? Well, fever is one of them. It's usually an acute onset, but it's low grade, so not a very high fever. You can also see a maculopapular rash. So maculopapular, so macules and papules on the skin. It can be pyritic, so itchy. And it can affect the face, the trunk. So you can think about the chest and the abdomen, the extremities, so arms and legs, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet can be affected by this rash. 
can also get arthralgias, so joint aches and pains. And it generally has a predilection for small joints. So you can think about the small joints in the hands and the small joints in the feet being affected. And you can also see conjunctivitis that is non-purulent, as you can see in this image here. So many of these symptoms might be common in other viral infections, but what you want to remember with this Zika virus is the predilection for arthralgias of the small joints that might tip you off that this is a Zika virus, especially in a patient who has traveled to some of those endemic areas. Some of the other symptoms of the Zika virus include facial puffiness, uveitis, and a temporary hearing reduction or hearing loss. And it's again, temporary. You may also see myocarditis and pericarditis. So myocarditis, inflammation of the myocardium or the heart muscle, pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium, the lining around the heart. So all of these things can occur in Zika virus less often, but they can. So if you see a patient with fever and a rash, but they also have temporary hearing reduction or hearing loss, that's a bit odd. So you might want to think about Zika virus as being a potential cause. And the symptoms last for about two to seven days. So what's important about the Zika virus is some of the complications, and it is because of the neurological effects. There's many different complications. The two that are kind of the big ones are the congenital Zika infection. We're going to talk about that in a lot more detail in the next couple of slides. And another major complication of the Zika virus is Guillain-Barré syndrome. Guillain-Barré syndrome is a neurological syndrome that occurs with ascending paralysis. So paralysis starting in the generally in the lower extremities or in the hands, and it ascends up toward the trunk. So up toward the chest. And what we get worried about with Guillain-Barré syndrome is if that paralysis reaches the diaphragm where the patient stops breathing. So this is a very severe condition. So with the Zika virus, this is a big one to think about. And the risk for Guillain-Barré syndrome increases with increasing age. So the older the patient is, the higher the risk that they could get Guillain-Barré syndrome from Zika virus infection. And it's more common in male patients. May also get meningoencephalitis, and transverse myelitis. So again, some other neurological complications I'm not going to talk about here. The big one I want to talk about is the congenital Zika virus infection, or what we call the congenital Zika syndrome. This is the one that has caught our eye in the news where infants have neurological birth defects from a mother being infected with the Zika virus. So what happens here? So we talked about this before. The Zika virus can cross the placenta and infect the developing fetus. And what it does is it enters the fetus and targets and kills what we call neural progenitor cells. These are the neural cells that are responsible in producing the differentiated cells, like the glial cells and the neurons. We're gonna talk a bit more about this in a bit as well. So what it does is it reduces neural proliferation, migration, and maturation. So it reduces the amount of nervous system cells, how they migrate in the nervous system, and how they can mature. So it essentially reduces the amount of brain tissue and the mature brain tissue in a developing fetus. So this leads to decreased brain growth, a smaller brain. And the greatest risk occurs during the first and second trimester. So what that means is in the first 24 to 25 weeks of the pregnancy, if a mother is infected with the Zika virus at that time and it crosses the placenta and it targets the neuroprogenital cells in a developing fetus, that is the greatest risk for there being neurological complications from the Zika virus infection. And we find that it affects about 5 to 15% of infants born to Zika infected mothers. So it doesn't affect all babies, but it affects about, we can think about in 1 in 10 babies that are born to in Zika infected mothers. So it's not insignificant. So what happens is that we have the Zika virus here, and it essentially infects and destroys these neural progenitor cells, which are cells that are responsible for differentiating into neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes are glial cells. These are the neurological support system. You can think about it that way. And these support the neurons. So if we have reductions in all of these cells, we're going to have a smaller amount of brain tissue. And that's exactly what happens in the congenital Zika syndrome. So some of the signs and symptoms, again, are microcephaly. This is the one that we see on the news. So here's a baby with a normal sized head, and here is one with moderate microcephaly. So because the brain is just not growing and not differentiating properly, it's smaller in size. And this is considered moderate microcephaly, and you can think of even severe microcephaly. So microcephaly, small microcephaly brain, essentially, that's what that means. You can also see ventriculomegaly, 
really what that means is the ventricles in the brain, these fluid filled areas in the brain are enlarged just because there's just less brain tissue there. You can also see intracranial calcification. So if you look on imaging, you might see some calcium deposits within the brain as well. You can also see some limb contractures as well in these babies. And you may also see hearing loss and visual abnormalities, again, due to that neurological destructive component of the Zika virus. This leads to increased rates of fetal losses. So if a baby doesn't develop properly, it is at risk for having a stillbirth. And this generally occurs in about 5 to 10% of pregnancies. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat the Zika virus? The diagnosis of the Zika virus can occur through real-time qPCR to detect viral genetics or the viral genome. And you wanna use this especially in the less than seven days of infection because the antibodies to the virus haven't been made at this time. So we can detect the viral genetics before, even earlier on, but the antibodies that the body might produce haven't been produced yet. A little bit later on, you may be able to do serology tests to check for antibodies against the Zika virus. So we can check for Zika virus IgM antibodies. If you do this, you want to also do something called a plaque reduction neutralization test, PRNT. This test helps us determine if the Zika virus IgM that we're detecting now is coming from a recent Zika virus infection as opposed to one that occurred longer ago. So treatment of Zika virus is a supportive one. So it's a viral infection. We don't have anything to treat it and it is self-limiting. It will resolve on its own. So a lot of times we want to be supportive. We want to treat the underlying symptoms. So it's again, symptom control. We want to make sure that the patient is well hydrated, well rested. We can use acetaminophen for pain control. And prevention of Zika virus is what we're really aiming for. Currently, there's no vaccine available for the Zika virus. It's still in development. But what we really want to do is we want to reduce the risk of getting a mosquito bite in the first place. So a lot of things you can think about doing if you're in some of those endemic areas I mentioned earlier. You want to make sure that you wear long sleeve shirts. So try to cover up as much skin as possible. If you're sleeping outside at night, you want to make sure that you have a mosquito net to avoid any possible bites from mosquitoes at night. And you also want to wear some kind of insect repellent to help reduce the risk of mosquito bites as well. So these are a few tips to help reduce your risk of mosquito bites please check out the World Health Organization website on the Zika virus for more tips on reducing your risk. And please check out the description below for the references used for this lesson. Also check out lessons on yellow fever and dengue fever. This mosquito we're talking about in this lesson, Aedes aegypti, carries the viruses that also cause those infections as well. So those are important to recognize and to understand as well. So please check out the lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.